I had a true love, if ever a girl had one. I had a true love, a brave lad was he. On fine Easter Monday with his gallant comrades, he started away for to make Ireland free. For all around my hat, I wear a tricolored ribbon. Oh, all around my hat, until death comes to me. And if anybody's asking me why do I wear it, it's all for my own true love I never more will see. Now my name is Noreen Byrne mm -hmm. and uh, my relative is my grandfather Joseph Byrne. Now Joseph was uh, born in Wicklow and so he's from Wicklow but uh, he was a docker in Dublin and um, I think that's how he became involved in the Citizen Army. He was certainly in the number one branch of the Transport Union so that was the founding branch and um, we, ha we have uh, evidence of that. The next kind of bit of information we have about him is that he joined the Citizen Army. Can you tell me what happened in the British Army? We think he was probably there for economic reasons, like a lot of um, people, uh, certainly in urban areas, where mm. I think. And I think he joined in 1907. Mm. And he was called up for uh, the First World War. And he got dressed in his uniform and went onto the boat at the Dublin docks and they were heading off to France and um, he uh, took off his uniform and uh, dressed in civvies, left his uniform behind and um, went up and joined the Citizen Army. Now unfortunately we don't know what his motivation was, if only we did, it's very yeah. interesting as to why that happened. He whispered goodbye love Old Ireland is calling High over Dublin our tricolour flies We're sure he was a socialist anyway mm. because we're all socialist kind yeah. of thing you know, we're very egalitarian in yeah. our family Well certainly in relation to the British Army it, it has to be been about money mm. because, you know, they got married they had one child after the other mm. you know, and um, I'd say it was financial, I'd say it was money, a steady job, the notion of a steady job mm. or a steady income. Then he progressed within the Irish Citizen Army. Well, I think it, it seems from uh, stuff I've read that there was kind of at least two phases to the Citizen Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, if he joined after the lockout, which was the first phase, you know, I'd say he was probably one of the few people, men, who had um, any kind of military experience mm. and maybe training, military training. Mm. And so it may well have been that that's why he was promoted, so to speak, at that time. I know afterwards, I think they got their act together better and it was more organised. Can you tell me about the famous photograph that um, your relative is involved in? Yes, well, um, I discovered the photograph in um, Frank Robbins' book, Under the Starry Plough. And um, that photograph wasn't in our own house, wasn't in my grandmother, grandfather's house. And uh, it was very interesting because I recognised him immediately. Mm -hmm. That's what was so interesting because obviously he was a lot younger than when I eventually saw him after I was born. He died when I was four. Okay. But I recognised him because, of course, he looked like, a bit like my father. Mm. Who, you know, it wasn't a surprise to me that he was found. I saw him on the roof of Liberty Hall. Mm. That was the interesting thing about it. But what I was very surprised about was that Liberty Hall itself doesn't have those photographs. There mm. any, has hardly any photographs uh, of uh, the Citizen Army. That You'd imagine that they'd have collected them. But I know from talking to historians at Liberty Hall that they don't, n nobody knows where, mm. who got the photograph or who took the photograph okay. originally. Certainly not in Liberty Hall. Um, would you like to mention all about the lead up to uh, 1916? Well, you know, all I can recall uh, being said at, in my granny's house, because I lived with them at the time mm. I was a baby, until I was eight, was that, um, you know, uh, 
while your grandfather was uh, out making the revolution, you know, first of all, I couldn't read or write, she said. Yeah. And, he, you know, he hadn't the time to teach me how to read and write. Yeah. She subsequently learned. Anyway. <laughs> and secondly, um, she, she, talk, she talked about the day uh, of, uh, of the rising, the day the rising started, how the people, there was, you know, one end of O'Connell Street was on fire, i.e. the GPO on the other end, people were taking furniture out of shop windows mm. and everything. And she remembers that. There was, there was an interesting little anecdote told uh, to my um, mother by my grandmother. Mm. And it may well have been before 1916, which was that um, the Countess Markovich came up one day in a car to, and they were living in a, a tenement house, came up looking for my grandfather, knocking on the door. And my granny was very, very upset about it. Very, very upset that this very grand lady would arrive at her door without my granny being given any notice that she was going to arrive because they were living in very poor circumstances. Okay. So she was she didn't like the countess because of that. Right. And she should have really sent somebody up to let me know she was coming. So she tidy up maybe. Or... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, would you like to tell me about uh, what Michael Mallon said towards the end of the rising? Well. It turns out, anyway, obviously uh, in Stevens Green, the vast, or they were in the College of Surgeons mm. at the end, the vast majority of the combatants, shall we say, were citizen army people, men mm. and women. Yeah. And um, the call for surrender came. There was a big discussion uh, mm. about it. Um, and, of course, nobody wanted to surrender. But um, Michael Mallon, anyway, lined everybody up and um, told them that... Um, or said, uh, any of you who are uh, soldiers or former soldiers, he, wa he wasn't really talking about deserters. Mm. If you had been former soldiers of the British Army, you might like to leave now because he, in his mind there was no question that he would be, they would be treated differently mm. and separated from their comrades and maybe hanged. And like, was he prophetic or what? Look what happened to him. Yeah. And so... Um, uh, there were a few people reluctant to go, but a, few, a handful left, is what we, I know. And my grandfather was one of them because my granny was seven months pregnant. And I think he was very concerned about that. So they left and um, they went to, uh, to Glasgow. In the streets of the city the full man is falling And we birds are whistling Old Ireland arise For all around my hat I wear a tricolored ribbon Oh, all around my hat Until death comes to me And he worked on the docks for a long time and he on the Clyde and he lived, they lived on Clyde Street in number 8 Clyde Street okay. because there were two or three babies born there when Frank Robbins came back from Frank, uh, Frank Ock, mm. and he went back into Liberty Hall, he was told to go to America to raise funds for the Union, because the Union was completely broke. And he uh, was told to go and work his passage. People used to work their passage on ships in those days. And he went to Glasgow to pick up a, boat, a ship to go to America. And he was given my grandfather's name. Go and stay with uh, Joseph Byrne. He's not called Byrne. He was under an assumed name. He was called. He called himself James Kinsler, which was his mother's maiden name. Right. So when Frank Robbins went anyway, turns out there was a, sh uh, a ship a ship strike, and uh, he didn't get to leave Glasgow for two weeks. So he lived with my granny and grandfather, and the kids, in Number Eight Clyde Street. Uh, over the course of the two weeks, they went to several um, Catholic social workers meetings. Okay, and. Margaret Skinner yeah. was the main speaker at one of them. So that's very interesting because Margaret Skinner had been in the College of Surgeons. And in fact, she was one of the few women that actually fired a gun. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and so she was there, but she must have left in some kind of a hurry as well because she ended up in Scotland. Frank Robbins is the author of um, a book called The Starry Plough. Mm. And he wrote that, uh, I, I suspect, after he retired. 
and um, it really it's his story, it's his life story about uh, his participation in the Citizen Army. The first record we have of them being back here is 1925. So we think they came back a little bit before 1925 and family story would tell us that he was very close to Larkin. Uh, he knew Larkin very well. He's buried in Glasnevin okay. and um, uh, he's buried with my grandmother and two of their children and um, I, uh, the, the, the grave is quite neglected, you know, mm. I left, I suppose my granny died and everything else and then as I as said before they were very poor. So a few years ago when I started investigating it I went and I got a new um, uh, head, headstone put on it. Yeah. Um, recognising his role in the Citizen Army. I think that's very important. Yeah. And I, I, I hope, uh, you know, uh, other people are doing it as well, or even the Union should try and do, uh, recognise that, that people, especially the Citizen Army, because it was so small, yeah. but at the same time, it was such an important um, uh, kind of initiative. It was the only workers' um, army, really, you know, that uh, before, yeah, that stood up for um, I suppose what you'd call now, using the language of today, kind of national liberation. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's lovely. And, you, know. you know, it's important to uh, give them their moment in the sun, so to speak. And if anybody's asking me why do I wear it, it's all for my own true love I never more will see. In praying and watching, the dark hours passed over, the roar of the guns brought no message to me. I prayed for old Ireland, I prayed for my lover, that he might be safe and old Ireland be free.